Welcome to the Social Selling Show with myself, Will Barron, and the king. It's a good, I, I like this name. We, I might quiz you on where it came from. The king of social selling, Daniel Disney. Daniel, how's it going, sir? It's going very well, Will. I am so excited to be doing this and um, yeah, excited to dig into uh, to this new show. Good man. Well, let's start with this because you are the king of social selling. I don't want to turn this into an interview show. We're going to get into um, why personal brand is so important within sales, B2B sales and social selling in a second. But where did the king of social selling come from? What 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 moment just clicked and you're like, that's that's me. That's uh, That's my branding from now on. I would like to clarify, it wasn't me that came up with it. I think that would be horrendous if I called and referred to myself as the king of social selling. Um, it was it was actually a, a group of people that do an amazing podcast um, in the bed series, basically. And they film these episodes, they're in their bed, and, and, and you're in your bed, and you do the episode through that. Really fun. It's Laura and Henrique. Uh, Henrique's from G2. Um, and yeah, they basically refer to me as the king of social selling. And as prep for the, um, for the episode... I said, oh, well, why not? I'll order a crown. And nice. um, so yeah, in the episode, I wear it. But beyond that, it just sits on on there. So yes, not me, but it came from other people. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm, I'm glad I asked now. And I'll, I'll check out that show myself. Okay, so we're going to get into a personal brand. So let's get started with this of what, uh, let's let's start with the basics and build up from it, right? And, and I'll give you my thoughts. But what, what do, you, do you have a definition of what a personal brand is? What, what the heck is a personal brand within the context of sales? I was going to say, to try and keep it as simple as possible, it's your, it's your reputation. It's how people perceive you. It's it's not something you define. It's something that others define of you. Um, so, yeah, it's something everyone has, whether you have a good one or a bad one. We all have one. We have this digital <laughs> presence. Whether you're active or not active, it still defines your personal brand. So the people that aren't active on, on social media, they have a brand. It's just not a good one. And the ones that are active and, and building it obviously have a more positive one. I've never thought about that. That's interesting just off the off the get-go. I've never thought about it like that. You have a personal brand, whether you choose to create it and create it or not, right? And I always pitch it like this um, from a more, just very specific to salespeople. Your personal brand is, and tell me your thoughts on this, as far as I'm concerned, when someone Googles your name, that is your personal brand. Whether your LinkedIn profile comes up, whether the court case comes up from you five years ago when you did something stupid when you were younger, and hopefully it's been forgotten. But that's the that's what I want to get into in this episode of how do we curate that and, and the benefits of it. But do you agree with that? Do you, do you agree in the Google age that your personal brand is what comes up on Google? Oh, absolutely. But it goes beyond just what is Googled. It's when people type in keywords into LinkedIn. If your profile isn't showing up, if your content isn't showing up, it's the conversations people are having, you know, decision makers are having with each other. Oh, what would you recommend for this? If your name isn't being brought up, that is a reflection of the personal brand you have or do not have. Okay, so I don't know your thoughts on this, and I'm going to ask you the question. And this has been a debate on multiple episodes of, of different podcasts and shows I've been on recently. Daniel, in the again in the in the Google age, the internet age that we're all selling through right now, the mid or mid post COVID as the vaccines start to roll out. So you know we, we don't have the opportunity to necessarily go and knock on doors and speak to people in person. Which is more important, a personal brand or discreet like on the phone email selling skills? Do you know what? I, I would be? It's probably the worst answer I could give. <laughs> it's both. I don't. I never understand. No, no, no. Why. Okay, let me, let me rephrase. I'm going to. I'm going to force the force the issue here. If you could either have an incredible personal brand, tons of followers on social media, and and you know, and I said a, a positive personal brand as opposed to a negative one, or you could be incredible on the phone, incredible traditional sales skills. Which one do you think would drive more revenue? God. Well, there's no, there's no easy answer to that. I'm going to go with the personal brand, obviously, yep. because it's worked so well for me mm -hmm. and I see it works so well for others. But I've also met a lot of people that can't necessarily pull off the same type of results and they yep. are better on the phone. And the phone is still working. People are still crushing it on the phone with email and things like that. So they're both valuable. What I can definitely attest to is how powerful a personal brand is. And certainly this year, I've seen so many more salespeople build and leverage personal brands where we've gone into this sort of remote virtual working environment and it is more difficult to get hold of people on the phone and certainly via email so there is a lot of opportunity but let's not let's not push away any of the other options yeah and uh, of course the answer is both i just wanted to kind of uh, get that a bit of debate going because and you're on the same side as this as me i think moving forward into 2021 personal brands can become even more important and, and let me give, give you uh, i don't know if this is an analogy or a metaphor i think it's a 
or a simile. I always get confused between the three of them. But if I ring you up, Dan, and say, hey, Dan, I've got some, I've got, I've got some investment advice for you. I never would do this because I've no idea what, what I would be uh, investing in. But if I was like, Dan, I've got some investment advice. You've got to take this up. Yada, yada, yada. Go full Wolf of Wall Street on you and start pitching you down the phone for penny stocks, whatever it is. And I'm an incredible salesperson. I feel like I'd get, because you know we know each other a little bit as well. We get, I'd probably get 50% of the way there. And I, I would consider myself to have you know above average sales skills. Now, so that's sales skills. If you put Warren Buffett on the other side of this, who probably has great sales skills as well, but obviously has an incredible brand, especially within the realm of investment. If he rings you up and you don't remortgage your house and put every penny you have on the advice from Warren Buffett, you'd be a crazy person. So that's how I that's how I in my mind differentiate personal brand from sales skills. Of once you've got that personal brand, you're building so much trust at a distance before you've even engaged with someone that a lot of the more traditional sales skills, I feel anyway, become become less and less important. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you a real example of that kind of really brought to life. If if you were a sales director, a VP of sales, and your CEO said, look, I've heard a lot about cool listening software, revenue intelligence, you know, we need to get something like that. Chances are a lot of VPs and sales leaders out there are going to go, well, do you know what? I keep seeing Gong all over social yep. media. Yep. And actually, Sarah Brazier, you know, she's an SDR and account executive. You know, I see her content. They're doing some really great stuff. I'll ping her a message. I will get in touch with them. Even though there are lots of different other platforms out there, there are lots of different options, other great companies. Gong has built up both a huge you know, business brand, but more importantly, they're investing in their personal brands for their sales reps. And so their name and brand is significantly bigger and will be the go-to for a lot of people. So that's probably the same thing. All these other companies probably have really good salespeople that are great at generating sales, mm -hmm. but they're going against the tide. And, and that's the challenge. Yep. And, and that's been my experience in medical devices. Uh, the last company I worked for was the, the there's two organizations that both do uh, endoscopic imaging, basically, the for, uh, keyhole surgery, if anyone's unf unfamiliar with that term. And I would sell the whole camera stack and a lot of the operating theater. And when you walk into an operating theater and you, or a, I don't think in the US they call it operating theaters, the OR, whatever. The the cool stuff hanging from the ceiling is what I used to sell. And I've worked for two companies, one Japanese company, uh, one German company. And the German company was so much easier to sell for because they were the cool company. And it was similar to what Gong does. This organization did loads of published uh, research. They would be far more likely to allow me to take a surgeon on basically a piss up or a trip to Germany and, and to go and spend some time with these world-renowned surgeons that they were affiliated with. They're basically doing influencer marketing before it was influencer marketing with all these different surgeons that they'd have on board. And it was so much easier to sell those products because, again, I would never, there was, there was, I've said this on uh, when I've been interviewed and on the sales podcast and stuff before. I never really cold called anyone because it was, hey, it's it's Will from XYZ Company. And it was, hey, come in, come, come have a chat with us because they wanted to engage. And I feel like Gong does that well from the perspective, uh, from, we can talk about perhaps individuals, but from a corporate perspective, they're always publishing data. They very, they, they send me data all the time that then, and we're talking about them now. We're doing advertising on their behalf and doing that brand building uh, for them, even though I've never actually used the product itself. So how how, how incredible and, and powerful is that? Yeah, and then the beauty of it is, it, again, it goes beyond the brand. Like their individuals are building huge brands and huge audiences where a lot of people either don't know what Gong is or what they actually do, but they know the person. They like the person. They've received a lot of value from the person. And that is a big advantage to salespeople that... And I think I hope we we're going to dig in this today. It's pretty easy and free to obtain. Yep. It doesn't take years. You don't need any prerequisites. Anyone can do it. Anyone has the opportunity. And it just takes a small amount of work. <laughs> okay, so we'll get practical in a second. I just want to do one final bit of selling the audience on this. I want everyone who's listening to like be, to be foaming at the mouth to put everything, the, all the practical elements of this in, into play in, in, a, in a few minutes' time. But Daniel... What are the benefits of this? What are the tangible benefits of, of building a personal brand, right? Do you know, it, it impacts both inbound and outbound. 
done this, you know, do this right, and you will generate and create an inbound lead generation machine that will bring in inquiries on a consistent basis. But equally, you're going to create outbound opportunities, opportunities to start conversations and to even, you know, accelerate the sales process. Because as you were saying, you know, when you're making cold calls, and I spent years making cold calls, you spend most of the time introducing who you are, yeah. where you're from. Chances are they don't know who you are. They don't know where you're from. You're trying to build that trust and credibility. When you've got a personal brand, a lot of those calls transform. And instead of, oh, hi, I'm Dan from so-and-so, oh, hi, I'm Dan, Dan, follow you on LinkedIn, love your content, love that post you did the other day. You've already taken so many more steps in that sales process. You're not starting, you know, at sort of point blank. And yeah, so tons and tons of opportunities. And, and just to double down on that, we call it, um, or it's org, building trust at distance. What you're doing is a lot of the hard work is being done for you by essentially robots, by computers sat in a server room somewhere they're working on your behalf as your as, as almost a promotional team for you and it could be uh, clearly you're, you're killing it on a linkedin me not so much i don't really put any effort into it i mean and for context i put zero effort into linkedin and i've got like nine thousand or something uh, seven seven or eight or nine thousand i don't even know how many thousand so many thousand followers and when i post something you know thousands of people see it now to introduce yourself to thousands of people you need a massive trade show and some probably cocaine or Red Bull or something to be able to get around. And you're not going to make a good impression because you're you're pushing your brand onto people as opposed to on LinkedIn. You're essentially doing inbound marketing and you're allowing people to take the content that you're doing and and, and to put their own thoughts and spin on it without the pressure of, of someone stood in front of them um, to try and sway the, their opinion on things. So th there's massive benefits in that because it's it scales, right? And I guess I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at here, Daniel, of what is the tangible benefits of a scalable brand? And I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll give one as it comes to mind of you become more valuable to an organization. You will probably have a higher base salary if you have a larger LinkedIn profile uh, audience because they know coming into the game that you've got more chance of, of getting more deals done. Is that fair? I, I've not I don't have a data on that. I don't have evidence that that's true. But if I was hiring someone. I'd pay someone more if they've got 100,000 followers on LinkedIn than someone who has 3,000. Yeah, I haven't seen it from a hiring perspective, but certainly from a promotional reward basis for employees. I've seen a lot of employees grow their personal brands whilst in a business and be rewarded pay rises as their audience grows, given more responsibilities, been promoted. You're absolutely right. It is a tangible value to a business. I mean, most businesses I see don't have more than two, 3,000 followers on LinkedIn. Yet I've seen SDRs and AEs and you know BDRs build up audiences 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 followers plus. You know, these companies have marketing teams desperately <laughs> trying to win LinkedIn and you've got a single SDR just putting out authentic content on a regular basis, building up a bigger audience, a bigger brand which becomes significantly more valuable. You think of how much money marketing teams spend on sponsored ads and content creation to get what two likes per post and 2,000 followers, you've got an SDR that's spending five, 10 minutes a day writing a post, um, you know, building these bigger audiences with bigger value. So there, there is a significant value to it, um, both from, you know, a value to the individual, the leads they're going to generate for them as a salesperson. You know, you get some salespeople, there's so many leads coming through that they get dispersed to the team. It becomes a genuine lead source to the sales team. Um, again, outbound, increasing velocity, you know, the, the list goes on. And if you're generating leads like that, you are essentially unsackable. And during a time of economic crisis, like this, you're laughing and, and tell me if, I, if, you, if you think I'm wrong, but if I hire someone, even if they're a terrible salesperson, but they're generating leads for the rest of the team, I might even rename them from salesperson to brand advocate or something like that. There's, again, your base salary might be way higher because that you might be able to, if you've got enough leverage within a marketplace and of course i'm not we're not talking here something that happens in months this might be years but if you have enough leverage in a marketplace you might be able to charge per inbound lead and, and build your own side hustle on, on the side of some of this i've seen some people start to do something like that not to a sort of full-time extent um but they've been able to build something that they are uh, they're rewarded from it and as we've said will this is super tangible and super achievable that yep. anyone has the opportunity to do so yeah lots of benefits 
Um, <laughs> but the key is to obviously know what to do, which is what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so let's get practical. How the heck? Because I'm sold. On the, <laughs> you've sold me also this, Daniel. Right, let's. Let, I want you to cover LinkedIn, and then perhaps I'll chime in on outside of LinkedIn uh, of, of different contents and platforms, and, and whether we need our own personal branded website and stuff like that. But give us the uh, ten thousand foot view of what we need to do on LinkedIn practically to just get the the ball rolling with some of this. There's two things you can start with, easy to do, five, 10 minutes a day, huge, huge impact on your personal brand. Create content and engage in content. Two simple things. Start sharing and creating your own content on a regular basis. Get your name out there. Two, three times a week, you know, up to five days a week, have your content going out there that's valuable to your audience. And then on the flip side of that, start commenting on industry relevant posts two or three times a day so that your name's getting out there. If you want to build a brand, you need to get your name, your personal name out there in a good, valuable, respected way. So if you're putting out valuable content and then commenting on other industry relevant posts every day that your prospect, your industry, your audience is logging in, they're seeing your name dotting up every single day. Do that consistently. You'll start to build a personal brand. Um, And it doesn't take long. I've seen people come from nowhere, build brands within weeks. Yep, I know. You know Sam Dunning, right? I assume you've gone back and forth with Sam. So Sam came out of nowhere. Um, I, I was on his <laughs> show recently. I'll link to the show that I was on, uh, and, and I'll link to an engagement you've had with him as well in the show into this episode. And Sam came out of nowhere. I've I've now helped him with a. I don't know if he wants me to share, but I've, I've helped him behind the scenes of a bunch of stuff of his show. He just sent me a bottle of whiskey to say thank you. I didn't know he existed like six months ago. And now almost every day we're engaging on different things. And and to be fair, I've not said this to Sam directly, and he'll, he'll probably catch up with the show at some point. But if I ever need um, kind of SEO, marketing services, things like that, of course I'm going to go to him. So the maybe there's a lag time of you've got to put a bit of work up front to earn business on the back of it, which is not unreasonable. Anything other than a, a cold call and just hounding a phone, you're going to have a little bit of lag time, whether it's an email, you've got to wait for a reply, or you've got to uh, get book that meeting, which is going to require follow-up. Um, so maybe the lag time is slightly longer than some of this, but the, the benefits are tangible. And, and that brings me to a question, Daniel, that you've probably been asked 500 times as the, as the king of social selling. How do we know when this is working? How do we know when we need to change tactics slightly? And how do we know when it's just not working at all and we need to rethink things? Yeah, quick step back to the lag time point. Just to sort of mention, you said that if or when you were looking for SEO. And that's a good point. You're not ready right now. So it may take you longer. It might take you a few months, weeks, maybe even years. But if you were looking for SEO right now and you've just built this relationship with Sam, you'd go now. It's only because you don't need it now. But there are lots of people that need SEO and Sam's winning that business because and all he's done, I think I think in this year, he's recorded 100 podcast episodes. He just celebrated his 100th episode. He's just been creating content and putting it out there. Obviously, he chose podcasting as his core point, but he shares those podcasts on LinkedIn. He creates content on LinkedIn organically anyway. And yeah, you're right. He came out of nowhere and he's built this big brand and, you know, it's helping his business, but he's building on something that if he keeps doing it, it's just going to keep going higher and higher. Um, but then going back to the to the sort of question, which is, you know, how do you know if this is working? You know, how do you know if it's actually delivering results? That's That's the point. Is it delivering results? Are you generating inbound leads? Question number one, yes or no? No. Okay. It's could still be starting to work but you know those are the results you want are you using it or is it impacting your sales conversations so are the prospects you're approaching are they aware of you before you speak to them you know are you making an impression before that conversation those are your most tangible metrics behind the scenes of that is your audience growing so how much has your audience grown over a period of time you know how much is the engagement growing on your posts are you still getting one or two likes a post or are you now getting 10 20 30 likes you're getting 100 likes you know is the engagement growing are the views growing you know is 100 people seeing it 1000 people 10000 people all those sort of things show that it is working but your ultimate metric of of success is money in the bank sales generated inbound or outbound Sure. And the way I like to think about this, you may be familiar with this. Uh, I think it came from the executives at HubSpot originally, but other people have talked about it, is the they talk about the marketing flywheel. So maybe 10, 15 years ago with, with HubSpot specifically, with the inbound efforts they do, they would just produce so much content, flood the market. And because 
if you Googled, I don't know, something that would cover CRM comparisons, the first page, oh, there would only be, say, 500 results in Google. I'm, I'm, I'm butchering the numbers slightly, but for the point, well, if HubSpot produce 30 pieces of content, they're going to be within the top 500 and they're going to get traffic from that. Now there's so much content everywhere that it's very difficult to just mass produce stuff. So what they do is, uh, what they focus on is what we do focus on over at salesman.org, which is what they call the marketing flywheel. This is, you produce one bit of content and the, the flywheel doesn't turn because nobody cares because you just some schmuck who's posted one thing on LinkedIn. But then the second, third, 20th, 50th, the flywheel starts to spin then. And it's big and it's heavy and it's laborious to get going. But once it's spinning, then you can take a week off and it's still spinning. Then you can experiment with something else and it's still spinning. Then you can add a podcast on the side of things or you could start doing mini interviews or whatever. And one flywheel turns the next flywheel. So your next project goes a little bit quicker as well. And that's how I focus on all of this. And going back to Sam for a second, you said 100 episodes there. That seems like a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And Sam is clearly having results on the back of all this now. He's doing great. But it's only two episodes a week for a year. And... I don't know about you, Daniel, but this year has gone past so <laughs> fast for me. It, it doesn't seem like two minutes since we were kind of like before, since January, when I was last planning all my goals for the year. So if you did get your head down for a year, you could have real like, amazing results on the back of all of this. Yeah, I'll give you another example. Obviously, Sam put a lot of time into it. You know, recording a podcast episode, as you know, uh, you know, takes time. I've seen people, and there's a sales trainer in particular always springs to mind, who had no personal brand, no presence, no audience, nothing, literally a nobody in the industry. And all they did was spend five, 10 minutes a day, Monday to Friday, every day at 8 a.m. They chose a specific time because it was before their working day. So before they even had to do any work, they wrote a post, long form text-based post on LinkedIn, a story, a different story every day. But they were all valuable, insightful, entertaining, thought-provoking stuff. And they did it consistently. And within three to six months, their audience had grown past 10,000. They were building an, a you know, globally known brand. And it didn't take long. They're way past 30,000 now. You know, one of the most credible people. Everyone talks about them from zero. And that's all they ever did. I think they did it for about a year consistently. Every day, 8 a.m., 5, 10 minutes a day, they just wrote a story post. One single activity. They didn't do the engagement. They didn't do all the other kind of you know stuff that you can do. That in itself, that small time commitment helped them build what then launched their own business. Are you going to shout them out? I feel like you just... You, you just you said give, give them a load of credit and then was like but i don't like them so i'm not going to cut off the name at the end of the the anecdote i don't like to name people unless they ask to be named but lots of people know usually when i, I say it, they, they do sort of uh they do sort of know who it is but there are lots of people doing similar things putting okay. out content like that and building a brand just wanted to give the impact that it, you don't have to spend hours a day you don't have to put up tons of time to do it it's just being consistent and giving value Perfect. Also, uh, you can tell me off uh, what what I, I feel like there's some shenanigans going on there, Daniel. <laughs> so you can tell me off in the air in a second. Right. Um, so before we wrap up here, what is uh, what can someone do? What's the next level on from this? Because there'll be some people listening and they're gone, Dan, king of social selling, Will Barron, uh, half knows what he's doing, perhaps off LinkedIn. I'll we'll touch on that in a second. But for anyone who's perhaps beyond the beginner stage, they've got a few thousand followers. They're doing what you're outlining there. What is the next step for them to get to that intermediate level where perhaps they're now engaging with an entire marketplace of, for me, it'd be entire marketplace of surgeons, as opposed to they're just trying to engage with urologists who are using this product and I want to be in front of them right now. Do you know what? The, the key for me was find a niche. So I built my personal brand in the start in sales. So everything sales, that's my background anyway. And it was only when I focused on the social selling and went into the niche that I then took it to that next step. And, you know, when I say it's not just finding the niche, but it's then defining it yourself and really putting your footprint on it. Hence the T-shirt, the hashtag, you know, the branding, everything focused around that core subject. And that helped me go from, yeah, a, a sort of a, you know, an average growing personal brand to something a bit higher. Um, so yeah, whatever your industry is, it doesn't have to be just uh, the, the industry in general. It could be a subject in the industry. It could be a topic. Thinking back to Sarah Brazier at Gong, her big niche was the SDR. Her role is an SDR. And she just doubled down on creating content and insights into that world um so find something something particular that you can then start to be defined for 
Um, and that is how you then take that next step. Yeah, and and for context, that's something that I've really struggled with over at Salesman.org. And the best example of this is we're doing a show on social selling as you were hashtag social selling t-shirt and your brand is about social selling. If you were just generic, generic down the probably quality and you know and valuable sales trainer, this this collaboration might not have come about, right? Because it's difficult for me to then pitch a show to you and, and get you on board with different things. And it's something that I struggle with over at salesman.org because from the very beginning, we've narrowed down things to B2B sales, uh, higher deal size sales, but it's too, still too broad. So how we're going about this is collaborations with people like yourself um, so that we can remain that kind of like broad or umbrella of things. But that is far more difficult, expensive, uh, difficult to get right. And, and, and to get that marketing flywheel going is far harder than you know taking your advice here. I wish you would have told me that six years ago, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know that, Will. So. <laughs> Good man. Okay, so and just some final thoughts from me uh, before we get to a couple of audience questions on, and, and, and I'll just throw this out there and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree. I feel like everybody, if possible, should own thename.com. So I own, uh, in fact, no, I don't even do that. I own willbaron.net because a, a, a freelancer designer from Sheffield, just below me here in the UK, a couple of hours away, owns willbaron.com I feel like uh, so and I'll just I'll throw it all that and tell me what you think so you should own your name.com it should have a website on there even if it just does link your uh, LinkedIn page and maybe a CV or a resume or whatever the Americans call it it should be you should be searchable you should on LinkedIn be linking to that page so that when you Google the page we, we won't dive too far into how Google works but uh, Google works on a, a basically like authority. If you get lots of links to a specific page from pages with high authority that Google goes, LinkedIn, that's a good site. They must know what they're talking about. Then you rise up the search engine rankings. So the point what I'm trying to do here is engineer when someone Googles you, it is probably LinkedIn at the top, then it's your own page underneath, and then anything else underneath that is perfect. And then I want people to start thinking about not just creating a brand on social media. I want people to start thinking about how they can get little tiny PR wins. For example, I was featured in the local um, uh, Leeds Bradford newspaper because uh, the local hospital had just done a massive deal, all new theatres, and I got the hospital PR team to mention me. So it was just a one line with uh, uh, Will Barron did X, Y, Z. And I then clipped that from the newspaper. That's on the site as well. And there's another link. So if you if you would have Googled me five, six years ago before I started Salesman.org and all that good stuff, it would have been LinkedIn page. It would have been the company profile page. Again, if you can get your company to uh, link to you on a blog post or something, if you can create content on their blog, even if it's just one page, that's valuable. And so I want people to engineer that that when you get Google, it comes up with these things. One, it looks good. It makes you look like a somebody. And two, if anyone writes anything negative about you, you've got somewhat of an ability, not that that should ever happen, but if it did happen, or someone who has the same name as you has done some horrific things and, <laughs> and, and their name pops up, or your name, you, you've got a similar name as a, a tennis star or you know a UFC fighter, whatever it is, which is unfortunate because they all come up when people Google your name. I want you to engineer that Google first page result uh, via those three or four simple steps so that you're in control of things. So Dan, it's one step beyond LinkedIn, perhaps, and this might be, if we've gone from beginner to intermediate, this might be what we do at a, a so-called advanced level. But what, what are your thoughts on that plan? I'm with you a million percent, Will. And I think it is something we should cover at the more advanced stage. I think that's sort of, you know, a bit further down uh, than, than entry level. But you're right. And even for a name as unique as mine, DanielDisney.com is taken, which frustrates me a lot. So I'm DanielDisney.net as well. Um, so yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Everyone should. And, and here's a thought for sales leaders and business owners out there. Why not provide this for your team? Don't own it. Give it to them. Give them the rights to it. It costs nothing to yeah. set up a, a web page, a URL. Set it up for them because it's going to help your company. Get your marketing team to design them a nice little website that looks good and half decent that links them back to their LinkedIn profile, your company, all that wonderful stuff. Set them up with it. It's going to make them feel amazing. Wow, my company set me up a website, my own website. But it's going to benefit you significantly as well. And then if they leave, give it to them. Don't be a horrible person and try and take ownership of it make sure it's theirs they own it they can change it they can edit it but it's going to benefit you way more than the tiny cost that it would be but you're right will absolutely everyone should have that 
yeah, it's, it's 10 quid a year for a, a domain registration, right? It's absolutely nothing. And that's a brilliant idea. That's almost something a sales manager could do as a Christmas present or, or, or something like that for the... Put, the, put your own money in it. Spend a couple hundred quid, get your team sorted out. And it's just, as, as you said, it's a, it's a nice little thing for them and it shows that you are going above and beyond for your team as well. Okay, I feel like, so we'll do another episode in the future. I've made a note here on advanced personal branding. We'll, we'll class this as the overview of personal branding and I guess we can we can cover this topic multiple times and we'll, we'll string them all together. So let's move on to uh, a couple of audience questions here, Daniel, if that's cool with you. And I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. Unless I'm going to see Daniel shake his head in a minute and be like, no, 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 no. So if you want to win a copy of Daniel's excellent book, The Million Pound LinkedIn Message. If we feature you on the show, if we feature one of your questions, Daniel will very kindly send you a copy. I'm, uh, I'm seeing the nodding in agreement here to make sure that I'm not going to, I'm not costing him tons of money every week with different books being sent out. So we're on the same wavelength there, which is good. So you can, right now, I'll set up a website for this in the future. We have a, a form that you can submit your messages. But right now, if you just email your social selling questions to will at salesman.org. And if we feature you on the show, we'll send you a copy of the book. So today's questions come from, I'm going to just use first names until I find out what's appropriate. So we don't call people out if they use a, if they say something that uh, might be disparaging to them or their level of skill. So Leonardo asks, would Daniel recommend deleting past LinkedIn connections if someone changes industry or sector? Um, it really depends. Generally, I'd say no. So an individual person on LinkedIn is an ind individual person. So whilst they may not be of any value to you or ever going to buy from you, they still have an audience. So that person might have 500 connections, 5,000 connections, 50,000 connections. Chances are there are going to be people in their audiences that are still valuable to you. So only if on an extreme scenario can you genuinely say them and their entire audience are of no value to you then okay if you really feel you need to but let's remember you have a thirty thousand connection limit so again you'd have to really be at your limit to even start considering deleting people um but yeah think beyond the individual they may never buy from you but if they click like or write a comment or share your content it's going to reach their audience and there is a much higher chance there's going to be people in their audience that may then become customers of yours so think of the bigger picture is is my advice i don't know if there's data on this uh, you're the king of social selling so i'm going to ask you is there any evidence that if you put out a post it goes to your connections is there any evidence that if you that there's a, a waiting in the linkedin algorithm where a high percentage of connections who see it who click on it or view it um, leads more leads to more sharing on the platform. What I mean by that is, is it better to have five thousand people who click on everything you do, or is it better to have thirty thousand people who see it, but perhaps out of those, only seven thousand people click on stuff? I didn't explain that very well, well, but hopefully it makes sense. I think I get what you're saying, Will. The, the algorithm used to encourage early engagement. That's why LinkedIn pods grew massively over the last couple of years. Everyone wanted those first few likes and comments because it meant that LinkedIn pushed the content out further and wider. That's changed and LinkedIn's algorithm now pushes dwell time. So how long a person actually stays on the post. So the people that are staying longer on the posts, then LinkedIn's pushing it out further and wider. So you want your content to be more engaging. Um, from an audience perspective, you know, you want to have the most relevant audience and, you know, the, the bigger audiences as possible, but you want it to be relevant or otherwise they're not going to engage in your content. So make sure you've got the right people. But I think a lot of people get too bogged down on quality versus quantity when actually if they look at it, there's probably a lot more people. You don't just connect with decision makers. Yeah. <laughs> don't just connect with people who are going to buy from you. Connect with other people within their business. Other There's never just one, rarely one decision maker on their own. Connect with the other, you know, influencers, decision makers in the business, other people in the team. There are so many insights and benefits than just people focus so much. I'm only going to connect with someone who's going to buy from me too narrow-minded the bigger picture opens up so many more opportunities so i so i knew about the dwell time i knew about uh or i knew is that the right way I, I understood about the linkedin pods was that a reaction from linkedin to stop someone sending an email or uh, in a slack group just getting 50 likes and it being fired out and now it requires someone to actually if they're looking at dwell time have it on the screen probably scroll slightly and then move on uh, and, and consume other content was that a reaction from linkedin to reduce the impact of linkedin pods which we'll cover in another topic i'm sure i was going to say we should cover pods in a separate thing i don't think it was linkedin trying to squash pods uh because 
pods in themselves didn't have much benefit anyway, that the small amount of increased engagement they got at the start didn't suddenly generate lots of opportunities because sure. it was just the same people, the same audiences, real minimal benefit. But I think it's LinkedIn constantly trying to make it beneficial to the user. So all they're trying to do is make sure they're you know, covering the right metrics and dwell time shows someone's actually reading the post. They're engaged and actually consuming it, um, which is a much better way of measuring quality of content um, over quantity or people trying to hack that engagement metric. So I think it's the right thing. Perfect. Okay, well, we'll wrap up with that then, Daniel. Anything we've missed? Anything you want to throw on the end of the conversation before we, we wrap things up here? Uh, a final bit of advice to everyone who's watching or listening to this. We're in December. Whenever this goes out, just start. Whatever day you're listening to this, whatever day you're watching it, start today. Go out there, log into LinkedIn, put your first post out, write a few comments, just start and then build it into your strategy every day. Have five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes put by and make yourself come onto LinkedIn. Just start doing it consistently. You'll be surprised what you'll be able to achieve just from doing that. Perfect. Well, with that, that was the king of sales, Daniel Disney. My name is Will Barron, and that has just been, I need a better outro for this at some point, everyone listening and Daniel, but that has just been The Social Selling Show.